What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Reg Nation. Listen, guys, I know that we touch on kind of heavier material here. So in 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 a way to try to lighten up some stuff, we're going to check out the worst military defeats in history. Guys, I've not forgotten about your comments. I am I have screenshotted um, a lot of the videos I'm going to get to uh, this next coming week. So just bear with me, but this is a way to kind of like, I, I found this organically, it was just on my timeline. I was like, oh, this should be fun, because it's not just about World War II or the fat electrician. You know, I want to check out some of these epic failures of, of military strategy, and this might open the conversation to possibly leading us down some rabbit holes to check out some videos that are out there. So anyway, without any further ado, this is from the, hold on one sec, this is from the Simple History Channel. They do their animated stuff, but at the same time, it's it's good, it's lighthearted. Let's just check this out, all right? So without any further ado, let's bring it up, let's bring it up and make sure I'm over here. Ready, three, two, one, let's go. The most humiliating military defeats Throughout history, there have been countless examples of larger, more powerful forces dominating the enemy with overwhelming force. Sometimes, however, the tables are turned, and the smaller force wins a spectacular victory, when on paper they should have lost. Here are a few examples of seemingly weaker militaries punching far above their weight class. So history is full of tales where the big guys kinda steamroll over the little guys, right? But every now and then, David sort of does slingshot the Goliath right in the face. Right. It's kind of like watching an underdog movie come to life. So, with that, here's a few jaw-dropping moments where the little guys went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the heavyweights, and they came out on top. Guys, and if you have any sort of comments, like, adding to the, to the historical, like, lead-up to this, let me know. Because that's how I learn in these in these videos that's how i learn is is the comment section and you guys I feel like i know nothing when it comes to our comment section because i'm like what are you kidding me so this is my 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 journey into trying to educate myself on some more stuff which is never a bad thing i say you ready for some seriously epic showdowns? Let's do it. Wars inside Vietnam. Oh my God, Perhaps no nation it, has made such a habit of embarrassing seemingly superior powers than the tiny Southeast Asian nation of Vietnam. In the 19th century, French Indochina was a colony under French rule. During World War II, the region would be occupied by the Japanese, and in 1941, the Viet Minh would be formed. Acting as a precursor to the Viet Cong, the guerrillas would conduct hit-and-run attacks on Japanese forces, liberating large portions of the region from Japanese control, eventually capturing the capital of Hanoi. After the war, the French authorities failed to honor pledges of Vietnamese independence, and in 1946, the first Indochina War began. Once again, using guerrilla tactics, the Vietnamese used hit-and-run strategies which baffled the French sent to suppress the rebellion. Eventually, they would score a decisive victory, capturing a vital stronghold at Dien Bien Phu, utilizing well-placed artillery and anti-aircraft guns to cut off and capture the installation, scoring a humiliating defeat against the French. In the aftermath, Vietnam would be divided between the Communist-backed North and the U.S.-backed South. In the 1950s and into the 1960s, the South Vietnamese were increasingly embroiled in conflict with Communist-backed guerrilla forces, or Viet Cong. Eventually, the U.S. was compelled to intervene to support the South Vietnamese regime. Over the next decade, American troops were sent in to an increasingly frustrating quagmire. While they had access to some of the most sophisticated technology and had massive firepower, they were unable to pin down the elusive Viet Cong and NVA and deliver a decisive blow. Each day, images of dead and wounded Americans were plastered across newspapers and on nightly news reports. The public outcry was intense, and in 1973, American soldiers withdrew from Vietnam, allowing the NVA to roll into Saigon in 1975. While the conflicts against the French and Americans are the most famous, this would not be the last time that Vietnam would stifle a supposedly superior foe. In 1979, China invaded Vietnam. The reasons are complex and included Vietnam's invasion of the Khmer Rouge-ruled Cambodia, and a falling out between the Soviet Union, who backed Vietnam, and China, who backed Cambodia. 
Regardless of the reasons, in February 1979, PLA troops entered Vietnam. Numbers are disputed, with estimates ranging from 200,000 to half a million. Wow. Facing them were around 100,000 Vietnamese troops, many of whom were veterans of the recent war with the U.S. Their objective would be to capture several cities along the Bodia. Regardless of the reasons, in February 1979, PLA troops entered Vietnam. Numbers are disputed, with estimates ranging from 200,000 to half a million. Facing them were around 100,000 Vietnamese troops, many of whom were veterans of the recent war with the U.S. Their objective would be to capture several cities along the border. As they advanced, their progress was slowed by incessant guerrilla attacks, which stalled out the advance. The PLA did manage to capture several border cities, after which they declared victory and left after a month of fighting, claiming that this was the only objective of the campaign. This comes across as hollow, as the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia, the cause of the war, continued for another 10 years. Wow. Despite being outnumbered, the Vietnamese inflicted heavy casualties on the aggressors and also declared victory. I didn't know China invaded Vietnam at all. What? And they faced a very similar, similar style warfare. Man, was this like massive news? Global news? Because I've never heard about this at all. Though the exact casualty figures for both sides are hotly debated, and the results of this brief conflict described as inconclusive at best, it goes to show that once again, Vietnam managed to hold its own against a much larger and more powerful enemy. All right, so I'm sure you knew about the American intervention in Nam, and maybe the French control of Vietnam earlier before that, yeah. but this Chinese intervention in 1979 is way less known. So the Vietnamese must have been really exhausted by then. So we got both sides claiming victory here. The Vietnamese repelled the invasion, while the Chinese forces captured some territory on the border. Who do you think won? The Battle think, of Longawala. Well, I don't think anyone wins. No one wins. You know, uh, the fact that China had to march into Vietnam, like that... Did they have to? I, like I said, I have no idea what was going on then. I know that we... I, I think the... What was it? The, the In Vietnam, the politicians completely botched everything in, in, in Vietnam. I, I want to say. But, alright. And look, these are battles I've never even heard of. The Battle of Long Walla. In the 1970s, tensions between India and Pakistan were at a fever pitch, which resulted in the Indo-Pakistani War of 1971. In December, the Pakistani leadership attempted to take advantage of India's lack of attention on the western front of the conflict, focusing a major strike into the seemingly undefended sector. Seeing the approach of between two to 3,000 Pakistani troops, with around 40 tanks and supporting artillery batteries, Major Kuldrip Singh Chanpuri of the 23rd Battalion Punjab Regiment had to make a decision. He and the 120 men under his command could flee from this overwhelming force or the other option would be to stand their ground at the outpost of Longawala in Rajasthan. He opted to stand and fight, as he lacked the necessary transport to move his men quickly enough to avoid this approaching force. On December 4th, scouts reported the rapidly advancing Pakistani column, and Chen Puri radioed headquarters desperately requesting support. The Indians laid down a hastily placed minefield to delay the enemy as long as possible, and hoped that their other prepared defenses would be enough. Mm. The Pakistani tanks rolled ever closer to the outpost, the Indians holding their fire until they were within a few yards before unleashing a volley from their Piat guns, a World War II-era anti-tank weapon. In addition, they also made use of a Nissan Jonga, which is an acronym for Jabalpur Ordnance and Gun Carriage Assembly, a type of jeep with a mounted M40 recoilless rifle on it, which, due to the Indians' elevated position, tore through the thin upper armor of the Pakistani T-59 tanks, the Chinese version of the Soviet T-54. Pakistani infantry support was bogged down by a patch of barbed wire, which they believed to be the border of a minefield, and lost valuable time trying to clear the non-existent explosives. Adding to the confusion, flames from the exploding tank's fuel illuminated the area, giving the Indian soldiers a clearer view of the enemy to shoot at in the darkness, and the billowing smoke added a literal fog of war to the equation. 
Pakistani forces then attempted to outflank the outpost from a different direction, but the soft ground caused their vehicles to become stuck, making them easy targets. When dawn arrived, the Indian Air Force was able to operate, and a flight of HAL HF-24 Marut fighter bombers and Hawker Hunters arrived on the scene, tearing into the Pakistani forces, who didn't have the necessary air cover to fight back, as their air force was deployed to other sectors. Oh there God. is some controversy as to the effectiveness of Chenpuri and his men, with some claiming that the bulk of the damage done to the enemy was by the Indian Air Force, and their accomplishments were over-dramatized for propaganda purposes. Regardless of this, the 120 men at Longawala had managed to hold off an enemy force 20 times its size, wow. while suffering minimal casualties. When the dust settled, around 200 Pakistani soldiers had been killed, with 34 tanks destroyed or abandoned, That's and many insane. other vehicles knocked out of action. The garrison suffered two men killed, with one jeep with a mounted recoilless rifle destroyed, as well as a number of camels which had been killed in the artillery bombardment. Due to his action, Major Kuldrip Singh Chandpuri was awarded the Mahavir Chakra, the second highest award for bravery in the Indian military, and would later be promoted to Brigadier General. The Battle of Longawala would be one of several decisive battles that ensured an Indian victory during the war. Jeez, talk about... You know, it's it's funny, like, we hear these these types of tanks they use, and, you know, you could, you could definitely argue, like, oh, well, that's not really a... a a good tank but a tank is a tank especially if you don't have any you know if you don't have any tanks and they had a couple recoilless rifles like dude hey i love i love these stories of like the the underdog the 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 one that you wouldn't place your bets on overcoming the odds and and winning i mean a lot of these at least i feel like a lot of these are going to be uh defensive defensive stories when you have to defend your position that's when you that's i feel like that gives you an edge not always not always by any means but that gives you an edge that gives you more of a reason to fight is you're in a defensive position you know or you know the terrain better than an attacking force because look at look at vietnam like that was their that's their home turf right and like like these guys they were just defending their post from an attacking force, so I, I feel like that's that might be a, a common a common theme of this. Who knows? But already these are two these are two things I never even heard of ever. This is nuts. See, this is what I wanted on this channel. It's like the different different country stories, like not just focusing on the UK, not just focusing on the US. Yes, that has that that has been kind of like where we've what we've stayed on but i wanted to get out and check out other countries like it does our community a disservice just to stay with what we know you know we got to explore we got to we got to figure these things out cuz these are these are pretty epic to say the least about overwhelming odds those indian soldiers vastly outnumbered and using outdated weapons from world war 2 um, <laughs> they show us the importance of defensive tactics and unconventional warfare when countering a numerically superior enemy it's really like a modern day 300 spartan story yeah. by screwing up pakistan's offensive india prevented the potential breakthrough in the wow. western sector which really could have diverted indian forces from the eastern front where the main thrust of the conflict was happening the battle of kane According to legend, as a youth, the Carthaginian general, Hannibal Barca, swore an oath to forever be the enemy of Rome. Decades earlier, Carthage and Rome had fought in the First Punic War, with the Romans defeating their adversaries, forcing Carthage to give up valuable territory and pay a humiliating indemnity. Undeterred, Hannibal drew up plans to strike back at his hated enemy, advancing directly into their homeland. Because Rome controlled the Mediterranean Sea, the only route from his base of operations in Spain to the objective of Italy was through the rugged Alps mountain range. In one of the most legendary acts in military history, Hannibal led his army across the Alps, arriving in the Po Valley in 218 BC. There, his exhausted, depleted, and now stranded army was set upon by Roman legions, sent to eliminate this threat. These Roman forces were crushed by Hannibal's brilliant generalship at the battles of the Trebia and Lake Tresemine, allowing him to march around the Italian peninsula with impunity. Undeterred by the losses, the Romans gathered a third massive army under the command of two consuls, 
Lucius Aemilius Paulus, and Marcus Terentius Varro, who in 216 BC set out to destroy Hannibal once and for all. The Roman force of around 80,000 men and 6,000 cavalry caught up with around 40,000 Carthaginians and 10,000 cavalry, a mixed force of Numidian, Spanish, and Gallic troops near the village of Cannae in southeast Italy. The exact number of the forces involved is subject to some debate by historians, though it is agreed that the Carthaginians were vastly outnumbered. Considering the numerical superiority of their army, the Romans abandoned their normal, flexible, maniple formation and were arrayed in deep columns, designed to smash through the Carthaginian infantry. With a river on their right and the high ground on their left, it was hoped that the Roman cavalry on their flanks would be protected from the superior Carthaginian horsemen. Hannibal arranged his weakest troops, the Gallic and Spanish infantry, in the center in a crescent facing the Romans, enticing them to attack. The Romans fell for the bait, achieving initial success as the densely packed Roman infantry pushed into Hannibal's center, bending it back and even managed to break through. In the chaos of shattering the Carthaginian center, more disciplined Libyan spearmen closed in on the Roman flanks before they could exploit the breach, stopping the momentum of the Romans and allowing the Gallic and Spanish tribesmen oh to reform. As this was happening, the cavalry on the flanks engaged. On the right were light Numidian cavalry, whose task was to pin the Roman cavalry there in place. On the left were Hannibal's heavy cavalry, who smashed through the Roman horsemen on that flank, driving them from the field. They then swept around to the right wing and charged into the Romans who were being harassed by the Numidians, likewise sending them from the field. With the Roman cavalry force neutralized, the Carthaginian oh cavalry God. reformed what? and struck at the rear of the now stalled out Roman infantry. Surrounded, the Romans panicked. They were so closely packed together they were unable to wield their weapons effectively, and coordination broke down, meaning that a breakthrough was impossible. Estimates vary, but it's believed that around 40 to 50,000 Romans were killed that afternoon, including Consul Lucius Aemilius Polus, while the Carthaginians lost between 6 to 8,000 men. That's in spite nice. of their overwhelming numerical superiority, the Roman army was surrounded and all but obliterated by an army half their size. Wow, that's some Tactics. serious guts to take on the Roman Empire. You know what's crazy? Hannibal's love for those colossal war elephants, right? But get this, in the Battle of Cannae, he pulls off this victory without even busting out a single one. Wow. The capture of Belgrade. In 1941, the German... Okay. So, I mean, that's what I love. Like, these these tacticians, man. They, they sometimes mean the difference between... A win and a loss especially with 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 numbers like if you know that you're coming in with with less numbers right you got you gotta have your your tactics on point because that's the only way that's the only way to to you have to outsmart the enemy you know i mean it, that, that's crazy so you put the weaker guys in front collapses and then you just sandwich like you you it's crazy how you have to calculate the loss of the front line like it's it's a tactical loss like okay we're gonna put these guys out there they're gonna break through and when they do break through we we collapse the pocket and surround them an army marched into yugoslavia and soon the capital of belgrade was surrounded by wehrmacht and ss troops after days of bombardment the city had suffered thousands of casualties but still refused to surrender as the Germans were making preparations to assault the city, an incident occurred that proved to have quite an unexpected outcome. On April 11th, a reconnaissance company under the command of Captain Fritz Klingenberg of the 2nd SS Panzer Division, or the Das Reich Division, was scouting the outskirts of the city. His task was to search for and hold bridges or other crossing points until the rest of his unit could arrive, because as the Yugoslav army retreated, they had destroyed most of the bridges to the city. After hours of scouting, Klingenberg found an opportunity. An abandoned motorboat was recovered, and he, along with a sergeant and a few privates, crossed the river around the city. The boat tried to return, but struck an obstacle and sank, stranding Klingenberg and five other men on the far side of the river. With no choice but to go forward, he made the most of this situation. A short while later, they encountered a group of Yugoslav soldiers who surrendered before they were discovered by another group riding on trucks. 
After a brief firefight, those also surrendered, providing Klingenberg and his men with motorized transport, making use of their captured prisoners, including a bewildered German tourist who had been stuck in the city when the invasion began and who was pressed into service as an interpreter. They bluffed their way past military checkpoints and made their way to the city center getting involved in a two-hour running gun battle with some of the city's defenders. After shaking off their pursuers, they made their way first to the war ministry, but that building had been abandoned. They then went to the German embassy, lowered the Yugoslavian flag, and raised the German swastika. They were soon confronted by the mayor of the city and several officials. Klingenberg demanded the city surrender, claiming that he was a forward reconnaissance force for several SS and Wehrmacht divisions, and he would call in artillery and airstrikes on the city if they refused. What he didn't tell them was that his radio was damaged oh and God. incapable of transmitting. He and his men were almost out of ammunition. He had no authority to demand the surrender of the city, and technically he wasn't supposed to be there to begin with, as his commanders had no idea where he was at that moment. Oh my the mayor God. didn't know any of this, and after some negotiation, agreed to the surrender of the city without any further resistance. About 1,300 soldiers and militia laid down their weapons and turned control of the city over to Klingenberg and the other five Germans. Yeah. The next day, the rest of his unit, as well as other German forces, entered the city, expecting a fight, and instead walked into an undefended city. With this audacious bluff, Belgrade fell to the Germans, the only That's casualty being a crazy. private who sprained his wrist after a fall. For his audacity, SS Hauptsturmführer Fritz Klingenberg would be awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. He would later be killed in action in 1944, struck by a tank shell while fighting against the Americans. The Battle of Gate Pa. In 1864, the British and indigenous... That's crazy. You just bluff. Just bluff. I mean, how many? Like, I... <laughs> it's not an uncommon story. It's just... Just bluff. Just bluff. That's it. <laughs> Hopefully, you're basically screwed anyway. So why not just, just have that... Have that, I'm supposed to be here. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And you, you most likely will win the day. Because the opposite is you're probably about to get destroyed anyway. It's that's pretty pretty epic. Indigenous Maori people were engaged in a vicious war for control over territory in New Zealand. In order to defend their lands, the Maori decided to make a stand at Pukehinahina, or Gate Pa, a defensive structure designed by Pene Takatuaya, a leader who had experience in engineering and was also familiar with British tactics. The Pa, or fortress, was designed with a number of Rua, or anti-artillery bunkers. These were small, only capable of holding a few warriors, which mitigated casualties should they be hit. There were also a series of earthworks and trenches designed to confuse an attacking force and were a surprisingly effective defense against the British artillery. In April, a force of around 1,700 British regulars under Lieutenant General Duncan Cameron marched on the defiant Maori, expecting an easy victory over the 230 or so defenders in Gate Pa. On April 28th, the attack began, with multiple artillery batteries opening up on the fortifications. Among these were a 110-pound cannon, two 40-pound pieces, as well as several 24-pound howitzers, which commenced with the heaviest bombardment of the New Zealand wars. After firing for about nine hours, 15 of the Maori had been killed, and a section of the Paz wall was breached. Cameron ordered the assault on April 29th. The attackers were made up of soldiers from several infantry regiments. After another artillery bombardment to further damage the walls of the fortification and eliminate any remaining resistance, the attack began. A skirmish line would screen the advance, laying down covering fire as the main force from the 43rd Regiment would spearhead the assault, while elements of the 68th who had crept behind the pod during the night would cut off any Maori retreat. They would rely on speed and ferocity to sweep away any resistance. The initial assault went well enough, though the situation quickly fell apart. There's some controversy as to what exactly happened, oh. though it's generally agreed that the British attackers came under fire from the Maori as they advanced, and once they entered the fortress, the attack fizzled out. The Maori opened fire at point-blank range from their hidden trenches or engaged the British in hand-to-hand -hand fighting as the attackers tried to navigate the labyrinth of trenches, earthworks, and barricades of the fortress. A large portion of the officers who led the assault were either killed or wounded, and the soldiers lost coordination. 
With the situation rapidly deteriorating, the British retreated from the fortress, leaving behind 35 dead and 75 wounded. The Maori casualties were unknown, but were believed to have been light, around half that of the British. Knowing that they could not stand a protracted siege against a subsequent assault, the Maori looted the dead and wounded for supplies, and then slipped through the British lines, escaping into the night. The reaction from the British and New Zealand public was one of disbelief. Being baffled as to how a force of 1,700 of the most well-equipped and highly trained soldiers in the world could be beaten so spectacularly by only 230 indigenous fighters. They were branded as cowards, and Duncan Cameron's reputation was forever tarnished by one of the greatest disasters in Britain's colonial history. What? These are just a few examples of apparently weaker militaries holding their own and triumphing over more powerful foes, whether through tactical brilliance, enemy incompetence, or just dumb luck. It goes to show that numbers are not the only factor towards victory. So these so with the, with the exception of the Nazis in what was it Bel Belgrade, all these guys were were defensive forces. They were they were defending their post, you know. And honestly, defending your post, what you believe in, and and knowing the territory like that's that gives you that plot armor to fight even harder than an attacking force. So, so this is this is pretty interesting, guys. I never knew anything about any of these battles like i didn't know china invaded vietnam and honestly the ancient the ancient um the ancient battle that one with the against romans like that interests the hell out of me like the tactics then just so different i mean not really tactics i feel like they they maintain the same principles but it's just interesting to see play out in front of you i mean especially when it's kind of like put out there like like in video form that way you can see it it's and it's that that interests me so much is seeing the different tactics and um the mind really the mindset of these of these generals these these leaders that kind of send their people to purposely as, at least in that specific battle the front line was supposed to break and when it it was a calculated break which is crazy because when a line breaks it means everyone in that line dies or retreats that's why it's break breaking or broken so that's the kind of stuff that i love this this is stuff that fascinates me to be honest anyway guys this is lighthearted. this is something that's hopefully this sparks the 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 conversation and hopefully we can check out some of these battles or some of these these conflicts because i don't know anything about any of these maybe you guys do i don't I don't I mean that doesn't say that doesn't say a lot really. <laughs> but I'm here learning. I'm trying to learn. Anyway guys, much love. Thank you for rocking with me. Thank you for rocking with the channel. Make sure you unplug and do something legendary and I will be getting to your comments in in the in the videos of the comments that you've requested later on this week. Um and guys, don't forget World of War is on Rumble for free. The links are all over our channel in the community post okay um and make sure i'll be getting i'll be getting to those probably twice a week um because those are a little bit lengthy and those are a little bit like it's just heavy content heavy content so maybe uh we'll get two of those a week um if that's okay with you guys just let me know in the comments as well anyway much love Unplug, do something legendary, and I will see you all in the next video. Later, guys.